morning, everybody. On behalf of the COBRE on opioids and overdose in Rhode Island, the West Virginia Clinical and Translational Science Institute, the West Virginia IDEA Network of Biomedical Research Excellence, the Rural Drug Addiction Research COBRA in Nebraska, and the Center for Addiction and Disease Risk Exacerbation at Brown University in Rhode Island, we would like to welcome you all on day two of the 2022 Symposium on Substance Use Research. I'm Shilpa Butch. I am Associate Director of the Rural Drug Addiction Research Center and Director of the Nebraska Center for Substance Abuse Research. And we are truly excited to have you all join in today. Now, it is truly a dream come true, an honor and a privilege to introduce our second keynote speaker of the symposium, Dr. Yasmin Hurd, who I had a good fortune of meeting several years ago in Cortona, Italy for a terrific uh, neuroscience course. She basically needs no introduction. She's a Sarina of addiction research. Dr. Yerd is a professor of psychiatry and director of the Addiction Re Institute at the ICANN School of Medicine at New York, Mount Sinai. She's also the Ward Coleman Chair um, in Translational Neuroscience. She's internationally recognized for her work in neuroscience and translational mechanisms of the neurobiology of drug addiction and related psychiatric disorders with a focus on opioid abuse and developmental effects of cannabis. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Medicine, a true honor, truly. Um, just by brief introduction, she obtained her undergrad from State University of New York in biochemistry and behavior and the PhD from a very prestigious Karolinska Institute in Sweden in neuropsychopharmacology, was also a docent there. She has been amazing in terms of research and also her service. She's on study sections. She has the diversity and equality committees organizes several international conferences is a keynote speaker and Amazing, amazing contributions, being on the editorial board of several top uh, journals, Translation Psychiatry has published extensively. She's also on the uh, on the Netflix and, and, you know, CNN, you should check her out. It is an amazing, amazing show. Uh, she has over 200 publications, several grants, but basically her work translates. She's a pioneer in helping us understand how stress and how other comorbidities can impact the next generation. So without further ado, I invite Dr. Hurd today to give her presentation. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you so much, Zupa. That is really a, a very kind, kind, kind um, uh, introduction. And I'm really happy to um, join you today. Um, you know, hopefully in the future we get to meet again um, in person. Uh, you know, we're still during this uh, crazy COVID time, um, perhaps. I'm just going to decrease my screen here a little bit so I can, yeah. So in any case, as I said, thanks very much for inviting me um, to participate in the in, in this event. And I'm going to say with a third that I have nothing to declare except that, you know, we all obviously share this mission of how do we not only address, you know, the issues of substance use disorders in our society at many different levels from behavioral, neurobiological, but, you know, to um, really have treatments and to give people their lives back. I don't have to tell you guys in this audience you know, when we think about addiction, you know, it's very complicated. And we're, we're, we really are talking about a disorder that has many different um, vulnerabilities from a neurodevelopmental perspective, especially with early life events, such as trauma and impoverished uh, conditions. Genetics, we know, plays a role. And the combination um, that I'll talk a little bit about in terms of epigenetics is really, you know, critical. The behavioral traits and psychiatric comorbidities also that really lends itself to this addiction. And for us, you know, the aspect of addiction is really about addiction risk because without the use of the drug, we, you know, this disorder doesn't happen. And for me, a big, big goal in my research has really been, can we, can really understanding the neurobiology help to give us some insights that can then drive um, even new treatments. Now, I say that in the context, as Shilpa mentioned, I'm the director of the Addiction Institute at Mount Sinai. And we have one of the largest opioid treatment programs in the country, treating thousands of people daily. 
for opioid use disorder. And obviously, despite, you know, we, we are still in a huge opioid um, crisis, this opioid epidemic has had tremendous economic um, burden. Obviously, our healthcare system is under siege, which many people don't realize that treating opioid use disorder costs a lot more than treating other medical disorders. And we, you know, we've talked about, you know, treatments that are even the, that are not using for those that have been shown and are there um, to help patients. Um, they're not used or not suitable. And we still have a lot of people dying daily from opioid overdose. And this got worse during COVID, as most of you know, in the stress and the isolation where substance use went up. Um, and in particular, we have, which I call really, you know, fentanyl is not a drug to me as much as it is a toxin. It, it, it's really a poison. And that has contributed to the increasing number of overdose deaths. So for me, you know, when we think about, we have such a huge issue with opioid use disorder in our society, and that where, where are we when it comes to treatments? And I was actually really surprised to see that from 1919, there was even an opioid maintenance clinic that had been created. And throughout the time, there's been, you know, the development of new medications. But this is for, you know, a lot of, um, uh, for substance use disorders in general, when you think about opioid use disorder, 1964 was when methadone was first introduced. And since then, all the other um, treatments, such as buprenorphine or even naltrexone, that have been developed are all focused on the same things in terms of um, the new opioid receptor itself and no real new treatments. And this is a real tragedy in large part because we have a lot of people who need treatment for opioid use disorder but don't receive it. And even for those treatments that are there like um, methadone, buprenorphine and so on, there's a stigma for treating people with, with opioid medications um, as again, this audience, I don't have to tell, you know, why that's so um, ridiculous, but even the challenges to access those treatments because even of the governmental regulations that exist in, in, in treating with opioids themselves. And I still think that in our, our, in our field, in our clinics, there's still this one size fits all thought about, you know, treating opioid use disorder and other substance use disorders. So, you know, we have, from a neurobiological perspective, we all thought that, okay, if we can understand the neurobiology of addiction, we'll be able to develop new treatments. And definitely, especially basic science, basic neuroscience has taught us a lot, especially about the pharmacology of, of addictive substances and brain regions that are really critical for mediating some of, of the phenotypes that we see um, in substance use disorders. You know, for example, in the striatum, especially the ventral striatal nucleus accumbens region, really important for reward expectation, goal-directed behavior. Other parts of the striatum, the dorsal striatum, important for habitual behavior. The prefrontal cortex, obviously, for cognitive control. Um, orbital frontal for um, goal-directed behavior, cognitive flexibility, and, and so on. So we know a number of brain regions that are really critical for that. You know, initially, as you all know, our field really focused a lot on dopamine, such that when, you know, the hypothesis of when the drugs are used acutely, that dopamine levels go up, um, people feel the reward, the euphoria, and when dopamine levels go down, then they get dysphoric and the craving would start. But we know it's much more complicated than that. There are, you know, numerous neuromodulators, neurotransmitters and neuromodulators that are really critical for this complex disorder. So for me, a major um, focus of my research, uh, which initially was kind of challenging because people didn't think that we really could do this, was could we really start to get molecular insights about the human brain itself? And could some of that knowledge help guide new thoughts about developing treatments? And this goes for all substances. As I said, I'm gonna focus in large part about the molecular insights that we've had about opioid use, just in, in, in large part because, um, actually I started off studying cocaine, but at our postmortem brain back collection really um, was filled more with people who had died from opioid overdose. And just again, to emphasize the, the, you know, the challenges and the, the detrimental nature of opioid use disorder. So what do we see when we look in the brains of heroin users? 
we can look at it in many different ways here, just looking at different strategies for looking at gene expression. This is in, for example, the nucleus accumbens, and we can see that to the right here, genes are either increased or to the left of this inflection point, um, genes are either decreased. And you can see in the right hand that the expression patterns in someone who is a control individuals from, from a heroin individuals, there are significant differences that you can see you know, even if I always tease that you're not a computational expert to look at all these genes. So what do we see when we looked at the stratum initially? Well, perhaps I, it wasn't I was surprised necessarily, but we saw really strong dysregulation um, in regard to the glutamatergic system. Genes and gene networks are related to synaptic plasticity, both in the ventral stratum and in the dorsal stratum of people who had used heroin. And not surprising is that you know, the striatum receives huge innervation, glutamatergic innervation from the striatum and even from the amygdala and hippocampus. And these regions obviously are really critical for, um, for regulating striatal function along with dopamine. But one of the things that we saw um, back then that we were very surprised about was this really strong um, dysregulation of epigenetic mechanisms. So, what's epigenetics? We know that. You know, as said, initially, addiction is a very complex disorder. There are genetic components, but there are also components of the environment. And this is where the environment actually can regulate how genes may be turned on and off, um, overriding even some of our genetic um, signatures. So genes that should be turned on are now turned off due to the environmental tags that are go on to DNA. And Epigenetic mechanisms and epigenetics as a field in general is very complex. So we are adding layers of complexity and complexity. There are many different epigenetic modifications. I'm not gonna go into it today, but you know, in large part, um, we're still learning a lot, but you can say, see, for example, when DNA is methylated itself, it really relates to transcriptional repression, turning off genes. While for example, when genes are acetylated, they can be turned on. But there's much more complicated. But what we saw in terms of the changes that were there in the striatum of heroin users really suggested this um, epigenetic dysregulation in predicting increased acetylation and transcription. But interestingly, it was not global throughout the genome. It was really, we could see that there were significant relationships. For example, here at the time, uh, MD-PhD student, Gabor Gavari, who now runs his own job soon, um, it, we could see that epigenetic marks that were dysregulated correlated very much to these glutamatergic or synaptic plasticity related genes in heroin users, but not in controls. We also saw that is very specific where these changes are occurring on the DNA. And these epigenetic changes, for example, these acetylation of a particular part of the gene of the, the histone tail around which DNA, um, the DNA is wrapped, these proteins, um, the acetylation of these enhancer regions related to the amount of years of heroin use. And we could see that in many different ways, many different techniques of how we study the human brain. But because humans are obviously very complicated, have men, you know, their lives, we don't know most of the things that happen in their lives. We, we use our translational animal models where animals actually self-administer heroin. And when we looked in the striatum of animals that had um, indeed self-administered heroin, we, we could find very similar epigenetic changes. So in regard to the assimilation of these, um, these epigenetic tags that were put on and in the same places in the genome as we saw in humans. So what does that mean? As said, we have, we have learned, sorry, I'm just gonna um, just disable, um, it's floating, yeah. As I said, you know, we've, we've learned a lot about epigenetic regulation of transcription, and we know that tags, as I said, can be put onto DNA or on the histone tails around which the DNA is, is wrapped, and these enzymes that do that are called writers, obviously they, these tags have to be taken off, they're called, erasers, but they're also those that must read them and appropriately they're called readers. And one of these readers these are these bromodomain readers that actually read these acetylated lysine residues that are put on um, to, um, to, these, to the, these lysine tags. And these actually turn genes on. 
there are about four of them in, um, well, three in the brain, um, BRD2, BRD3, and BRD4, these bromodomain um, family of, uh, of proteins. And we could see that actually the bromodomain family that was changed in the brain are not global again, that it was very specific to one subtype BRD4. And the increase in BRD4 um, actually correlated to the years of heroin use. This was also, BRD4 was also very interesting because it directly again correlated to markers of synaptic plasticity. Here, for example, DLG4 is a gene that encodes the postsynaptic density, the PSD95, that plays a critical role in excitatory synapses, the structural organization of, of synapses. And this is the human brain, and this is a crazy, very strong relationship between an epigenetic mark and marks related to synaptic plasticity. So as I said, there's a lot being done in, the, in understanding epigenetic mechanisms and even being able to use them to target as potential treatments. But the field in which the epigenetic mechanisms are studied in large part for treatments is cancer. So the cancer field, obviously cancer is a dis or cancers are disorders where epigenetic uh, modifications take over, epigenetic mechanisms go awry, and the cancer field has been developing a number of medications or potential treatments to target different epigenetic uh, modifications, including these bromodomain and extraterminal um, families, including BRD4. So the question is, could we inhibit BRD4 and, mod and modify heroin um, behavior? At that time, when we started, the prototypical um, inhibitor of BRD4 was this compound called JQ1. And later we found it's not as specific to BRD4, but we were able to at least use it in our animal model and to, to infuse it into the striatum. And we could indeed reduce heroin self-administration in these animals and their heroin seeking. Obviously, we're not going to infuse a drug into people, <laughs> into their brains. So giving it systemically, you could also see that, BR, uh, that this um, BRD4 inhibitor, JQ1, it significantly reduced heroin self-administration behavior. So from studying the human brain, we were able to see that um, the history of heroin use directly correlated with these epigenetic and glutamatergic um, synaptic plasticity-related genes that directly relates to drug seeking behavior, and those could be reduced by inhibiting these specific epigenetic mark. So we started to develop programs of now um, trying to identify more specific BRD4 inhibitors that could be used, that have been used clinically in cancer, and that we can try to see if we could use it for our clinical studies. And unfortunately, this is where some of the stigma comes in, in trying to find um, companies who want that their, treat, their medication for their disorder, for a particular disorder, could be used also for substance use disorders. And that has been a very big challenge for companies wanting to um, give their compound for at least for us to test. So we're still developing BRD4 inhibitors that pass the blood-brain barrier in a, in a good manner um, to treat. But we can see that other um, basic science groups have also shown that their BRD4 perturbations with other drugs, for example, cocaine, and inhibiting BRD4 with these BT inhibitors also reduces, for example, cocaine self-administration and cocaine-seeking behavior. So I think that this is an important important strategy that we're going to, we're determined to get the, the pharmaceutical companies to hopefully um, help us to do clinical trials, because looking at the human brain, translating to our animal models, developing neurobiological targets is the goal to helping us through to clinical studies. One of the things that when we first started seeing these epigenetic changes um, at the transcriptional level, the gene expression level, the question was, what does the epigenome look like itself? And so at that time, new technique had been developed where we could actually look at the epigenome in an, um, a non-biased manner. And what I mean by that is normally when you look at epigenetic mechanisms, you're normally tagging up a specific epigenetic mark to see where that mark is in the, in, you know, in, into the, in the genome. But a tax sequencing, which is an assay for transposase accessible chromatin, what it does is really allow you to look 
irrespective of the epigenetic tag, what does the chromatin accessibility look like? And importantly, this, this technique from a, a human br um, brain perspective is really important for us because you don't need that much material since everybody is so unique and when we use a particular tissue, that's gone forever. So being able to use small amounts of tissue has helped us because this technique, as I said, small amount of tissue, and we can even start looking at different cell types, for example, neuron versus non-neuronal cells like glia. So what do we see when we look at the epigenome now in a non-biased manner? We could see that indeed, you know, we, um, there are significant changes in relation to um, heroin use. And where the accessible, the, the low, the, the genes that were associated with these epigenetic changes on a functional level, they related once again to these aspects of synaptic transmission, the glutamate receptor activity, regulation of synaptic plasticity. But where was the most epigenetically, um, the epigenetic modification in the epigenome related to this gene locus called FIN? In fact, the epigenetic, um, this epigenetic locus, this change, explain nearly 68% of the variants associated with heroin use. So it was also interesting that it was specifically in neurons that, and not in glia. So what is FIN? So FIN is interesting because it's a SARC tyrosine kinase, and it's actually a member of this postsynaptic glutamatergic um, synapse that regulates um, the site architectural dynamics. So perhaps if we were paying attention, we would have you know, looked at every single protein in the synapse, but this is re was really surprising to us. We see it not only on an epigenetic level, but we can also see it on a gene expression level in the human brain. Again, we can replicate that in animals that self-administer heroin and even in our cell culture work. And in animals where we know their history, we could see that the fin correlated to the amount of heroin they use really strong association. But FIN, as I said, is a sarcinase. And it's what its actions is as a kinase is to phosphorylate. And so it's at a protein level, its active form is its more functional form. And we could see once again, that heroin increases the active form of FIN. And that active form of FIN then regulates its downstream targets. And we could see in the human brain also that fin correlated to the years of heroin use. So what are the downstream targets of fin? One very interesting one is tau. In fact, it, it, it regulates the accumulation of hypophosphorylated tau. And we know that hypophosphorylated tau is a classic um, pathological hallmark of a number of neurodegenerative disorders, including the tauopathies, Alzheimer's disease, and so on. Is it, initially we were um, actually I, I should have I wasn't surprised but yet still surprised and the reason was a few years before that we'd actually seen increased hyperphosphorylated tau in the brains of heroin users, but at that time this is this was looking at on a um, pathological level at that time these immune marks for hyperphosphorylated tau, I just thought that. The people who had used heroin when they were intoxicated probably fell and hit their heads enough time that it was causing this quote unquote, you know, sign of potential neurodegeneration. But here we see it on this epigenetic level, we can replicate it in our animal models in terms of fin and the hyperphosphorylated tau. Indeed, we could see even hyperphosphorylated tau in the animals that self-administered heroin and even in our cell culture models. An important thing about um, tau is that it's phosphorylated by a number of kinases, but where we see that it's, it was specifically um, phosphorylated was this part that was targeted by, by um, fin, not in, by other regions of, of tau. And we haven't done the whole entire tau protein, so there may be some other kinases as well, but we could see that there was specificity to the hyperphosphorylated tau that was really linked to fin. So, when we see these, as I said, these, these potential marks of, um, you know, you have hyperphosphorylated tau in the brains of heroin users, is it heroin or are there opioids? And is it, we don't think that, or at least I don't, you know, um, 
opioid use disorder is not a neurodegenerative disorder. It's not that people have Alzheimer's, but is there an increased risk for neurocognitive um, deficits? And so what we did here, my student Randy Ellis, was actually just to look in electronic health records and see whether or not opioid use is ever predictive of future neurocognitive um, diagnosis. And I'm not gonna go through details here, but just to say that indeed, we see that in, in patients who were given um, a number of opioid prescription, when you look at them five years and 10 years out, we can see that those that had um, uh, also a history of substance use disorder, there's an increased odds for them to be diagnosed with neurocognitive um, disorder um, later in life. So there is this direct link, even on a, on a more, and I said, on, in, in our healthcare system that we can see this significant relationship between opioids and neurocognitive um, diagnosis later. So back to our animal models. If Finn and this, this network, the signaling that we can see is perturbed by opioid use, can inhibit it, it really help to reduce um, uh, drug intake. And so we could knock down the gene, Finn, and we could see indeed that it could reduce heroin seeking behavior in animals. But again, as I said, a lot of our work is really what have we learned about the, the, the neurobiology of opioid use that can help guide pharmacological treatments. And so here we were a little, uh, well, not lucky. There was, a, again, just like when we saw for the, the bromodomain inhibitor, that there was a, a, a drug that was specific here. There was a drug, um, sarcatinib, which was AZD530, um, which is when we started, and that was a FIN inhibitor. And this FIN inhibitor, we wanted to see do, what does it do to heroin self-administration behavior. Here we let animals self-administer heroin. We made them work even harder even to get heroin that depressed many times. And in giving them the sarcatinib, it reduced their heroin self-administration behavior. When we are trying to develop medications for, for substance use disorder, we don't want it to impact on every single aspect of their of their, uh, 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 you know, rewarding aspects of life are, are still very important. So here we, we even tested for their food self-administration, just normal um, reward. And we could see that the inhibiting fin with the sarcadid did not change their, their heroin self-administration um, behavior. So there is specificity to this fin in inhibitor um, that again tells us that this these epigenomic changes that relate to a target really relevant to synaptic plasticity is not only associated with heroin use, but can be targeted for treatment. So here is where I would love to say once again that we you know, identified a treatment that a company that has been testing it for, so our cannabis should have said is being tested for treatment for Alzheimer's disease that you know, they would be open for us to do studies of opiate use disorders, but that hasn't really happened. They, we've been told to wait, wait, wait. And, but, but the Yale group has actually looked at um, fit inhibitors for alcohol use disorder. And in animal models, um, the Reed Brown's group at UCSF has shown that um, reducing um, fin can reduce alcohol use, um, intake in animal models but the, the, there was a, a clinical study in people with alcohol abuse disorder and Finn was not able to reduce their alcohol intake. So there's still a lot of work to be done, but from the perspective of the fact that we see these, you know, um, indices of Finn dysregulation, especially with regard to tau dysregulation um, in a number of disorders, but really strongly in opioid use is really critical. And, that actually brought us to another aspect when we, we, we saw these, these indices of neurodegenerative um, uh, pathways being dysregulated by opioids. So most of the studies that I've just showed you related to changes occurring in the, in the striatum. And obviously substance use disorder, as I said it to start, is a disorder of the whole brain. Really, there are many different neural systems you know, um, that are important, including the, uh, the prefrontal cortex and orbital frontal cortex. 
And indeed, the orbital frontal cortex is you know, really critical for guiding decision making, for the value of the reward towards goal directed behaviors and, and cognitive flexibility that we all know is dysregulated in, some, in opioid use disorder. So we wanted to look at the orbital frontal cortex. And to, in sequencing the orbital frontal cortex, my student Randy Ellis again, another interesting thing again, we see that the, the molecular, the neurobiological pathways that relate to these molecular changes, again, you see Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, Park, Parkinson's disease, a lot of these neurodegenerative um, biological pathways. So the question for me was, okay, can we start looking at this in another way even? Um, can we let the machine actually tells us on its own, again, trying for an, an, an agnostic non-biased manner, can we use machine learning to, to, to identify what is the signature of a person that has an opiate use disorder versus a control subject? And that's what we did, for example, is showing you with the orbital frontal, frontal cortical data that we did in sequencing the, the gene expression um, profile. And, and we could see, I'm not gonna go through what the machine learning um, was, and I'm not even gonna tell you what the, the gene is because it's not really relevant and not published yet. But one of the things that we could see is that the machine learning models all accurately predicted heroin users versus control. And there was a particular gene that it kept on, I, that it identified all the models. I'm just gonna call gene X for now. And the thing is, when you look at the machine learning, G, it also showed us that Finn, even here in the cortex, was also um, a, a, a network that was significantly associated with heroin users. But this gene X was also identified. And another gene that perhaps we should have looked at. And we know that when we looked in the brains of human heroin users, we see that it's significantly downregulated. The same thing in our animals that self-administer heroin. But here we can see that actually the increase in fin is what is associated with heroin-seeking behavior. So depending on where they are in their cycle, we can see differences. We can use our animal model also to overexpress the gene. And we could see that in overexpressing this particular gene, it could um, change the heroin seeking behavior and even their reversal learning in terms of cognitive um, flexibility. So what does this gene do in the orbital frontal cortex when just under drug naive conditions? So we could sequence the, 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 the orbital frontal cortex after we overexpress this gene. And we were really surprised to see that just changing this one gene in the orbital frontal cortex actually mimic completely the gene um, dysregulation we see in the orbital frontal cortex when um, animals self-administer heroin and even in our human heroin users, which I'm not showing here. This is, so genes that are down-regulated with um, um, overexpressing this gene are also down-regulated when animals self-administer heroin and genes that are upregulated up when heroin is self-administered are also those that are upregulated only by changing this one gene in the orbital frontal cortex, which is pretty shocking. Once again, where these genes are changed comes back to postsynaptic density, synaptic plasticity, and also these neurodegenerative disorders um, pathways, such as, again, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's and a number of, as I said, these um, um, neurodegenerative um, disorders. So in using not only um, electronic health records, looking at the human brain itself, translating it, it to our animal models, we can identify specific genes and specific cells that actually mimics what happens in the human brain um, of, of heroin users. So these unbiased computational strategies now actually has helped us to identify new targets for medication development. And I hope the next time I am, I am invited in a, hopefully a few years, we can show you what, and hopefully some of these targets do turn out to be um, helpful in developing these new medications that we, we think is possible.
Another aspect um, of our translational work in you know, using animal models and, and, and our human studies and going to clinical, um, um, clinical trials really uh, stems from our work, which I'm not talking about today, looking at the developmental effects of cannabis on adult behavior relevant to, for example, opioid sensitivity, opioid um, self-administration. And a lot of our research has shown both, we can see from developmental THC, um, when we give animals um, THC during pregnancy, that their, their adult offspring will generally self-administer more heroin, especially when stressed. And even when we have the conditions such that they're, they're self-administering the same total amount of heroin, those adult animals with only prenatal THC that will run to get the first hit of heroin. Um, we also see as I was saying that stress exacerbates this. Um, and we have studied um, offspring, human offspring of women who had been exposed to prenatal stress and prenatal cannabis. And we can see increased anxiety and increased stress responsivity in their kids as well. When we look at our adolescent animal model um, that self-administered, that, that had um, THC exposure during adolescence, but um, are studied in adulthood and self administer they usually self administer more heroin. And here, behavioral traits just like humans play a role, but invariably, adult, adolescent THC would lead to greater self administration um, behavior for these particular doses and so on and paradigms that we had. But in our animal models, while we're studying THC, we know that in our humans, they have been using cannabis. And there are over 140 cannabinoids in the cannabis plant, or over 500 chemicals. So I wanted to see another cannabinoid. And we started to look at cannabidiol. And to our surprise, while we, we verbally saw that animals that had THC pretreatment would self-administer more heroin, animals that had been given CBD actually showed a decrease in their heroin-seeking behavior. But it was very specific. So just like humans, animals, then they're trained to self-administer a drug, saw an, a cue goes on in their environment. So they will press a lever for the drug and either a light goes on, a tone or a smell could go on depending on the, you know, the investigator's study. And after a while, they start associating that cue with the delivery of the drug. So when we look at heroin seeking behavior in animal models, basically what we do is we, we present the cue but they are not getting the drug, but the animals will still press a, a, a lot on the lever trying to get the drug. And that's what we see. We saw that CBD actually reduced. So I told you that we have a very strong indication as to what is the, the neurobiological changes that we see in the brains of human heroin users and the synaptic plasticity and glutamatergic dysregulation. And we can actually also replicate that in our animal model. Here's a prototypical gene that we saw as changed with heroin self-administration. And we could give the animal CBD and it actually normalize um, that molecular change. So we did a number of, of, <laughs> of, of pilots trying to see here um, in trying to find a company who would give me CBD for our clinical trials back then. Back then, there were, C CBD was not as popular as it is now, so there were really not that many companies. In fact, there was only one company, GW Pharmaceutical, that had been developing uh, CBD first for multiple sclerosis and then, as many of you know, for, for epilepsy. But at that time, they were really focused on, on multiple sclerosis, so they weren't interested in, in giving me this um, drug to, to study for opiate use disorder. But this company, perhaps because they were smaller, um, and I nagged them enough that they, they um, agreed to give me CBD just for um, this study. Uh, I even tried with NIDA to have them make a drug, um, the CBD for clinical trials, but they were like, it's too expensive. But luckily, they, GW did give me the drug. And what we did was basically do the same thing as we did in our animal models. So we can talk about doses and stuff, but they basically came from the animal studies. And it was a double-blinded placebo-controlled and participants were abstinent, short-term abstinence. And just like the humans, what we did was to show them um, videos of um, opioid cues or neutral cues. And when we, as it says, double-blinded, 
And so when we broke the blind on those individuals that had been given placebo, and when they saw the heroin cue, they craved. And giving them CBD, it reduced that. One of the things that we saw in our animal models, which is another reason why I thought that CBD would be very interesting, was that even weeks after the last CBD, when we studied the animals for their drug-seeking behavior, the CBD still reduced that. So we brought the people back a week after their final CBD, and indeed we could see that just like the, the, our animal models, that CBD had reduced, continued to reduce their seeking behavior. My postdoc, Alex Chisholm, who is right now having a baby, <laughs> um, good luck, Alex. Um, she has replicated in our animal models, again, that both in males and females, that CBD reduces heroin-seeking behavior. And we're looking at the molecular um, underpinnings of this to be able to even come up with perhaps better um, treatments once we understand in neurobiology, we can look in the prefrontal cortex, again, a region important for drug taking and relapse behavior. And interesting, we can see that that uh, CBD is changing neural networks, for example, even response to morphine. We can look in our classic um, uh, addiction-related um, brain region, the nucleus accumbens, here in the shell, that many people study. We can see that when animals um, see the cue, and of course there are changes that have occurred in their brain due to heroin, that genes are either increased or decreased, and basically CBD is normalizing that and even switching that back to our humans, that they, one of the things that we hadn't studied in our animals back then, what the humans told us was that CBD was really impacting significantly on their anxiety that was induced by these cues. So it's those, those individuals who had gotten heroin and they got a placebo, um, there was this increase in their anxiety and CBD reduced that. A week later, CBD was still reducing their, um, their anxiety, cue-induced anxiety. We also look at physiological measures here, cortisol levels. So when they got the drug cue, cortisol levels went up, CBD reduced that. Similarly, their heart rate, when they were shown the, um, the drug cue and had received placebo, their heart rate went up and CBD reduced that. Now we can go back to our animal models based on our human studies and start to look at anxiety-related behavior here. Jackie Ferlin, who's instructor in the group, um, look at different um, models. So here, um, giving animals, for example, a shock with a particular environment, and when they get that shock, they're given a cue, and here's the lemon, a lemon odor, for example, and we can look at different anxiety-like behaviors, and we can see that when the cue is given to animals, they show really significant changes in anxiety-related behavior, and CBD reduced that. So what's happening in the brain again, again, I'll just show this uh, overview, not the specific genes. We can see that once again, just like in the heroin self-administration, the heroin Q condition, genes are turned on and uh, are increased and decrease when they are, they are given that lemon Q and CBD um, reverses or normalizes that. And one point that I wanna emphasize is that what we see under both conditions with CBD relates to cells because it matters. So I'm not telling you what cell types these are, but this is, for example, an animal that is, you know, during, during high anxiety, the genes are to the right here are of zero are turned, are increased and the genes to the left are decreased. And you can see from one to six are different cell types. You can see that the blue genes are turned on and the purple genes are, are reduced. And CBD completely reverses that. So now it upregulates these the, the gene networks in these in these purple cells and decreases the blue cells. So there's a cell specificity to CBD's actions. And this is really important because it gives us insights as to particular networks that we see that CBD may be impacting in, in having its effect in reducing um, these Q-induced seeking or our craving in our human subjects and anxiety. We're right now conducting um, clinical trials. Um, we're hoping to be able to do something also with anxiety specifically, but in terms of trying to find the right dose and the formulations. And um, Karen Baki, amazing. Um, we're doing both neuroimaging and um, CBD treatment in the real world since we've mainly studied people coming to our labs. And Dr. El Salsis, who's an amazing addiction medicine physician, 
And we will see, we hope that, you know, that can give the, these studies can give us more insights, even in the, the circuitry um, level that we're seeing in our animal models with CBD. And hopefully, you know, in our clinical, in the clinical trial, um, that we can see that in the environment that people are in, that whether or not CBD can be effective. So with that, I will um, stop right now and just, you know, clearly um, studying the human brain stopped me a number of things. One, there's, you know, significant dysregulation in terms of synaptic plasticity and really epigenetically driven that can be targeted. But so CBD has been able to show us that there may be, um, it may also have a role and we hope that our clinical trials will help us to figure that out. But I emphasize the epigenetic nature, I wanna emphasize that epigenetics is unlike our genetics, which really we can change our DNA sequence, epigenetic modifications are reversible. And so I do think that, and for, as I was saying earlier, I have a lot of hope that we indeed will be able to develop medications um, that can reverse a lot of these um, neurobiological um, changes. So I showed a number of the people during the talk, I thank NIDA for you know, um, grant support and just a great team of people, um, both in our basic science lab on the left and our clinical group on, on the right. And I will stop here.